for the next uh, 20 minutes, or a little less than that maybe, the staff asked me to, you know, there are a lot of us out here today. These are them. They're going to be helping me with all kinds of errands. They do incredible science, and I thought it would be fun to share just exactly what they do so you can get a little breath of, of the nutrition group that organizes these that is really interested in learning from many of you and reaching out and collaborating. So not our bread and butter, but our hummus and carrot stick is the randomized control trial. Uh, we call ourselves feeders and bleeders because we do things like get people to eat soy or plant-based diets or garlic or ginkgo or fish oil or raw milk and we test these. We randomize individuals to different arms at different doses for different durations. Our two biggest studies were two big weight loss studies. There were a thousand people combined. And these two weight loss studies of Atkins, Zone, Ornish, low carb, low fat. So this is the feeder and bleeder side of our group, which is sort of where we got our base. So we do evidence-based cause and effect science. So we do diet assessment, we do behavior change. So all those fabulous pictures you saw just a minute ago take care of a lot of different things in the nutrition world, which is always a little confusing, and we try to make it less confusing by designing great studies with great questions of public health and doing great science. And I tell you what we have concluded, a whole, based, uh, plant, a whole food plant-based diet is the best way for the planet and for human health, and we do them in RCT studies. And then, because we do so many of these, we get invited to be on panels like these scientific statements through the American Heart Association on artificial, or what we call them, non-nutritive sweeteners, popular diet patterns. Hang on to your hats. We have an amazing paper on ultra-processed food that should be out in a few months, defining it, explaining what the consequences are, the future directions we need to go in. And the American Heart puts out a lot of policy statements. One of these was on procurement policies for work environments. One was on the difference between nutrition security and food security. One was recently on sustainable cities. It was a multidisciplinary team, and we looked at land and water and building construction materials, et cetera. And food was, again, one of the elements that was key for making these sustainable cities. Another topic that we've embarked on recently at the American Heart is this huge pledge to study food is medicine. And our group is doing one of the pilots for that. It's going to be a 10-year program, a, how do you say that word, decanal, decadal, decadal, something, for a decade. We're going to be addressing food as medicine. And you are so lucky, because one of the experts in the world in this is Lisa Goldman Rosa. She's here today. Erica Tribbett is on our team and is going to be on that panel also. Um, Maya Murthy, who I've worked with before, and two new people that I'm really excited to meet have been invited to this panel. So that'll be the afternoon plenary at 1.30 to 2.20. So we dabble in that, but it's new to us. To do better at it, we would need help from a lot of you and them. I'm just about to roll off the 2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee that releases an 800-page report that is often dismissed by the Secretaries of Ag and Health and Human Services as being too political. So I'm trying to learn some politics. and. Just trying to say that our group is trying to participate in uh, scientific and policy statements, and it's, that's new for us. Feeders and bleeders don't do so well at policy statements and, um, and things as such, but we're trying, we're dabbling, so we would love to learn from others on the campus who are better at that than we are. Thanks, Arun, take care. And then, we kind of dabble in some other things. So about 15 years ago, I got very frustrated with feeding and bleeding, and I started a course on Stanford called Food and Society. We actually published this paper. I don't want to go into detail, but it was really all about not discussing health, only talking about climate change, animal rights and welfare, and human labor abuses in the food workforce. So that was a fascinating excursion for me and led to starting a farm camp in Santa Clara Unified School District where Stanford undergrads go and our camp counselors, um, as well as field researchers, collecting data from the kids while they're eating vegetables on the farm. And here's um, Isabel, who's now in med school at University of Washington, who published a paper kind of on eating zucchini seven different ways at camp. It's just absolutely brilliant. Um, 
Charlie Hoffs just finished this. This is hot off the press. We have a group called the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative that I'll talk about in just a minute. And they, I'm going to pause this for a minute. You guys didn't give me a clock. Can you give me a clock? I need to see my count. Don't hold. God, you don't want to leave this to me on my own, do you? OK. Jennifer, help him give me a clock here. Anyway, Charlie went to this group and went to the land grant colleges, asked all the faculty who have food related courses to send them her syllabi, and created an overarching view of what it means to teach food systems in universities and all the different important elements that would have to be there. So she's sort of setting uh, a foundation for moving forward and doing better job teaching multidisciplinary food systems education in universities. Love this woman. She's off on a, what is that fellowship called? She's in Chile right now doing one of those fellowship things. Um, here's another type of unbelievable interdisciplinary science we get to do. This was led by a psychologist. Ali Crum, who loves to think about people's mindsets and how much they are a little worried sometimes about eating vegetables, or they're going to be overcooked, or they're going to be bland. And we did this experiment on campus with the dining halls, with six other universities, and chefs. And we named all the vegetables three different ways, either carrots, or high fiber, low sodium carrots, or twisted citrus glazed carrots. And guess what the students ate more of? twisted citrus glazed carrots. They did never change the recipe. And then the killer for my career is the servings they eat the least of were the high fiber, low sodium carrots. They <laughs> ate less than carrots. That is an added value. Low sodium, high carrots, added value. OK, this is totally not fair that that's worse than carrots. But Working with the chefs, twisted citrus glazed carrots was better. So it's some psychology um, work in there. And, and that's sort of the foundation of our Menus of Change University Research Collaborative work. We're using dining halls across 70 different uh, schools that have pledged to be part of this collaborative to do these studies. Okay, Super fun. Sophie Egan has just put out this amazing report that is so related to today's work. What they did across these universities was they pledged over a decade to reduce their CO2 emissions by 25%. They made the pledge in 2020. The goal was 30-30. In 2024, they were already at a 24% reduction. So they increased the goal to 40%. How many times do people increase their goal midway as opposed to adjust and say, I'm not sure if we'll get there on time? This is just staggering. So our group tends to engage in types of food engagement and innovations on campus. And there's a panel. So there will be a breakout session later with the amazing chef Andrew Main, Patrick Archie, who runs our six acre O'Donohue farm, and two of our students, Izzy and Kat, who are at farm camp this last year. And I'm going to join them for that and talk about Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. For another area, this is the shittiest job that I have. This is. Um, I work with microbiologists Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, and they are absolutely amazing. And a couple years back, we did a study with human beings and fiber and fermented food that lowered inflammation and increased microbial diversity. I don't have time to tell you the details. It's already been cited over 800 times. And I'm going to throw this up a couple times. Have you ever heard of an altmetric factor? So for faculty, our currency is usually who, how many people cite our work. And so, yes, we're in academia, and they've cited our work, so we must be legit. But another way to look at this in this day and age is how much traditional media and how much social media covered it when it first came out. And for citations, you typically have to wait for a decade to see how many people cited your work. But for social media and traditional media, it's weeks. So this particular one scored over 2,600 in the altmetric score. If you, if you want to Google it and see what is a good altmetric score, the answer is 20. So 2,600 is really, really good. Over 250, um, about 250 news outlets. We've been doing lots of other work with them. So here's three of our other publications with the amazing Sonnenberg team. So we get people to change their diet. The, the Sonnenberg characterized their microbiome. We hand it over to Mark Davis and Holden Maker at the Human Immune Monitoring Center, and they look at if impacts on inflammation and immune function. 
And the ongoing study's actually been funded by an ex-Stanford undergrad who's, undergrad who's done very well in life. We have 135 pregnant women who let us have them eat more fiber or fermented food, get their blood, get their poop, and now we have 122 babies born and we're tracking the transfer of the maternal microbiome to the infant microbiome. We're gonna track the kids for five years. We have amazing retention from these women. 135 started, 122 babies are still in the study. Woo, love this. So now we feed them, bleed them, and poop them. <laughs> so that is the next thing that we do. And there will be an amazing session on the microbiome. We do that. But look at this team, they actually have a lab where they're making their own fermented food. And so here's the Sonnenbergs and our postdoc Kate and our, our diet whisperer Dahlia and an amazing uh, gastroenterologist Sean Spencer along with Eliza who's gonna um, be making some fermented food. I guess maybe not today. And what else do we do? We've actually been getting a little more media savvy, so we spend a lot of time thinking about our acronyms these days so we can communicate more effectively. I hope you'll appreciate swap meat, our study here. This was a study of plant-based meat versus animal meat. Again, a pretty good altmetric factor. We've been cited over 200 times, over 100 news outlets, funded by Beyond Meat, and Ethan Brown is gonna be here soon, and he's gonna give Another keynote, Ethan is the CEO and founder of Beyond Meat, so it was his product we used versus animal meat. Lowered trimethylamine oxide, lowered weight, lowered LDL cholesterol, no adverse effects. I know they had all those newspaper ads from the Cattlemen's Association that the plant-based meats were dog food and ultra-processed, but head-to-head, -head, they do better on the environment, on animal rights and welfare, and on health. Okay, we compared the ketogenic diet to the Mediterranean diet. Oh, I'm just not big on keto, sorry. Um, this was covered in a bunch of media outlets and had a, a reasonable altmetric score. But the biggest altmetric score we got recently was with twins, identical twins, and thank you Arun for mentioning this. Over 200 outlets, great altmetric score, turned into a Netflix show that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But another funny thing is we, trying to work with different people, we had some folks look at biological clocks and telomeres. This is a new outcome for us. And uh, I didn't really think anything would happen in eight weeks, but it turned out that telomeres were longer in the vegans and their biological clocks showed that they were kind of younger after just the eight weeks. I'm a little annoyed. Our main paper got published in JAMA and had a great altmetric score and the damn telomere biological clock blew our paper out of the water as a secondary analysis. Almost 400 news outlets and almost 3,000 all metric score. So again, this is a great study. So our twin study is great science, but it, it is kind of small and short. It's not actually the best study we've ever done from design purposes, but we have never had this kind of impact in our entire life. I am stopped on the street by people who say they've gone vegan, constantly. Just last weekend in Orlando, Tomiko was there. I was, I was swarmed with people taking selfies. It was just bizarre. I, I, like, I needed a handler. It was so weird. And it was about health science communication. And I really thought the identical twin part raised the level of science by a notch. And that's why we got published in JAMA. But what Luis Sejoyos, the producer, knew was that the identical twins were entertaining and engaging. So it was a combination of science and entertainment. I had almost forgotten the Netflix was coming out and I thought we might end up on the cutting room floor. It turned out we were featured in it and we were on vacation the day it came out and my wife said, look, look, you're on TV, you're number three on Netflix. It's like, <laughs> this is so weird. I've never done anything like this in my whole life. And the story Louis told was amazing. So not only did he have our great science and the microbiologist, he had a Michelin star chef, he had a senator, he had a mayor, he had a chicken farmer, he had a regenerative cattle rancher, he had a woman whose life had been upset for her whole family by living next to a concentrated animal feeding operation, a lawyer, an advocate, some health professionals. It was a great story and it caught the eye of a cancer surviving uh, Stanford firefighter who runs the Cancer Foundation who said, 
could you do this in firefighters? We have a half a million dollars for you. We are now doing a new study called Ignite with firefighters. Do you think firefighters will be entertaining and engaging? I do. So sort of this whole new appreciation for that. And here's a tweet we got. And in this tweet, this is super nice. Wow, best psychom I've ever seen. I hadn't really heard of this woman. It was a multi-tweet, it was a tutorial type thing where she had a set of them. And if you kept going, what you saw at the end was Dr. Corbett was one of the scientists that got the COVID vaccine out faster than ever before and was very frustrated that people weren't taking the damn vaccine. And so part of this comment was, ah, why the distrust in science? Couldn't we have a little more entertainment and engagement around science? Bring it on. And so I really thought that was fabulous. And Lisa Kim helped us with a great video of our study. And we have a panel. So that's another panel today, is science communication in the afternoon about how you do this. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up. Looks like I'm gonna go a minute or two over, but Arun went a minute or two over, and so I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have to catch up here. I'll go fast. So we've been sort of exploring some of these things for a long time. One was to look at amino acids. So I've been a plant-based person for a long time, and I'm so sick of people asking me where I get my protein. And so here's all the amino acids that are in animal-based foods, and here's all the amino acids that are in beans, grains, nuts, veggies, fruits, even mushrooms. I hope you get the take-home point here. All goddamn plant foods have all goddamn 20 amino acids, all right? <laughs> Including all essential nine amino acids. Ah! It's so frustrating, and David Katz and I even wrote a paper saying, you know, they rank protein quality on amino acid composition and how digestible it is. But don't you know that it shouldn't really be the quality of the protein in the food, it should be the quality of the foods that you get your protein from. Because plant foods don't have as much saturated fat and have more fiber and don't have the same impact on the environment. Shouldn't that be part of the definition? So we've proposed modernizing the definition of plant uh, protein quality. And I got some postdocs to write a paper about this with us, and it wasn't just health, it was about economics and environment. So the next morning panel is going to be food and sustainability. And that's where I wanted to wrap up this talk, because we have been here for years. We started the Food Summit in 2010, then we had another one, and another one, and we switched to brown rice. Did you see that? Wait, let me go back. We had white rice, and so he said, why the hell do you have white rice? Why don't you have brown rice? Okay, so we switched to brown rice. Four, five, the sixth time we had something called a food forum. It wasn't quite a food summit. And that's actually what turned into the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative. And we stopped doing them for a while. And we did one last year after we got funded by Ethan Brown to do this plant-based diet initiative. You're about to hear the speakers on that now. I, I remember the very first one, our goal was to get a talking head from each of the seven schools to show that food resonates across the entire campus. And at that time, we were joined by the D School, Stanford Dining and Food Security and the Environment. And I am so excited that we are now joined by the Door School. So that's my wrap up. Thanks to um, Ethan Brown. He'll be here speaking soon from, um, for our plant-based diet initiative. This is the amazing group you should stop and say hello to because they are absolutely phenomenal. More than that, oops, sorry, I thought my next slide was something different. Anyway, this is what we do. This is what that amazing group of people does. And we always need help and we're always interested in learning more, especially about sustainability. This is where I thought I was next. These are the two who've done the most to run the um, conference. Can I have a big round of applause? That's the end of my opening. That's what we do. If you didn't know what we do, other than run conferences, that's what we do. And we're interested in doing sustainability. And we have a plant-based diet initiative. And we give away research money. And these are going to be the next round of speakers. So do I pass this to you? Is that how it works? OK, I'm going to pass it right to Rachel and her slides. Thanks. Go get them.